Well, hello, everybody. My name is Paul Manley. I'm the Member of Parliament for Nanaimo Ladysmith, and I'm coming to you from the unceded treaty territory of the Nanaimo First Nation. And my riding of Nanaimo Ladysmith is on the unceded territory of the Lyaxons, Dominus, Nanaimo, and Nanawis First Nations. It's a real honor and privilege to be here with you today. Um, just to give you a, a, a little overview, we're going to be talking about guaranteed livable income or universal basic income. Uh, these are programs that are similar, that have similar results. Uh, this is a proposed social program that is intended to create an income floor under which no Canadian can fall. And it's meant to uh, replace our social safety net, which we know is not catching everybody, and especially during this uh, COVID crisis. We're seeing a lot of people fall through the cracks. These are not programs that would eliminate the need for social housing, for affordable housing, for affordable public transit. Uh, those are still things that we need. And uh, a guaranteed livable income or basic income would ensure that people are lifted out of poverty and stay out of poverty. I've been bringing up uh, guaranteed livable income uh, for quite a while before I was elected. And then after I was elected in the House of Commons, every opportunity that I get, I'm, uh, I'm uh, bringing it up where it's appropriate. And we're hearing a lot more about this during the pandemic. So it's an it's a idea that is getting a lot of attention to it at this point. It's one of the key recommendations of the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's and Girls Inquiry is to have a guaranteed livable income. And uh, part of the process of doing this town hall is to educate people, to motivate people, because we're having a lobby day uh, on the Hill, and I'm a co-sponsor for that. It's for the Coalition for Basic Income, and uh, that's happening October 20th to 22nd, and we want people to, to be motivated and to contact their MP to let them know what they think about a guaranteed livable income or a universal basic income, and to, to promote this idea to your Member of Parliament. I'm very pleased today to be joined by a panel of experts who will explain the basics, talk about the benefits, uh, and break down some of the myths and misunderstandings. But we're going to start with a Canadian who will speak about guaranteed livable income uh, or basic income from their personal perspective. So uh, Monica Siolik was a participant in the Ontario Basic Income Pilot Project. She's a sole support parent and a self-represented performance artist based out of Hamilton, Ontario. She spent 14 years in... Uh, on Ontario Works and over 20 years uh, learning her industry. And Monica has dealt with issues of women's rights within the cultural sector. Uh, Monica has personal experience, as I said, as a participant of the Ontario Basic Income Pilot Program. And we're very grateful to have her take part in this town hall. So welcome, Monica. Thank you, Paul. Hello, everyone. My name is Monica Siolik but I am also known as Anne Noble. I am a sole support parent, a freelance performing artist, a former recipient of Ontario Works and the Basic Income Pilot Project in Hamilton. With my daughter, I live in one of the most marginalized neighborhoods in our city. As a sole support parent, having been on Ontario Works, I am most grateful for the help I received from my parents and my community. While my dad and mom fed our bodies during the 14 years, my love for community work and the amazing people with whom I served became my soul food, without which I know I would have ended up dead, if not in my body first, certainly within my spirit and my soul. Life on Ontario Works was very difficult at times. Healthy food was inaccessible. Mobility was nearly impossible. Shopping at secondhand stores was a lifestyle, and tearful days were the norm. Hope only lurked in through family time, difference made in community work, my participation in the performing arts, and faith in a better tomorrow. Having started theater in high school, escapism was something I always ran to, especially during tough times. So when I started raising my daughter on social assistance while working part-time and volunteering in the community, I had to find ways to refuel. So I started investing time in taking pictures 
for local photographers and taking part in community theater. And while the intention was to gain positive perspective through performance, often the reality of show business became yet another wake up call. Furthermore, furthermore, little to my knowledge, mixing community work with art and faith became an interesting combination. As much support as I received from the majority of my colleagues, it seemed there were a few who saw me as an opportunity for personal profit. And while my professional life seemed to be taking off on the outside, behind the scenes, I often experienced financial, psychological, and even sexual abuse. Something had to change. By then, being a parent and making compromises were my second nature. So I started to step away from opportunities to avoid certain people and situations. I came to realization. It was my definition of success that had to change. And though I knew the loss would be great, I also knew what was important to me. Though an aspiration once, fame and fortune were no longer part of the picture. That's when the Basic Income Pilot Project was introduced. I had nothing to lose. We already did not have enough. So if for whatever reason, I was selected to be in the control group of the project. The worst thing that could have happened would have been falling between the cracks at the cancellation of the pilot. But to my pleasant surprise, my family got the basic income. Instantly, our lives changed. Having escaped the toxicity of the environments I was in, I no longer had to be at the mercy of people who only saw me as a product ready to be sold. Now with basic income, I finally had the freedom to go in any direction that I wanted without the fear of backlash. Much to my dismay, however, the, the backlash continued. What made a world of a difference though was no longer having to receive welfare. Instead, having healthy food in the fridge, over-the-counter medication we could not afford before, transportation expenses, and a couple of new jobs, milestones I would have never been able to reach on my own. Unfortunately, this reality did not last very long, thanks to Mr. Ford's government. But by this time, I knew that if I continued working while receiving housing support as a single mom, going back on OW was not a choice I was willing to make. Quite frankly, I was ready to kick and scream if I had to, in order to free my family from the chains of poverty. And that's exactly what I did and have been doing ever since. Today, while I'm still being a sole support parent, a professional performance artist, an activist and a volunteer, I am still kicking and screaming. This time, however, I smile while doing it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Monica. That's a, a really, uh, compelling story that you've shared with us and I really appreciate you you giving us some insight into how the program worked for you and the struggles that you've you had prior to to uh, taking part in the in the, the pilot program I didn't tell you before but I was a professional musician for 10 years and, and worked in the arts uh, industry for a long time so I know a lot about those kind of struggles that uh, that can happen uh, when when you're not making it the way that you want, you know, the, the way you dream about it and struggling with, with work and, uh, and a child and, uh, and yeah, children and all that. So thank you very much for sharing. Um, we'll, we'll um, see if we, you know, have questions for you at the, at the end, but we're going to move on now to um, Evelyn Forge. Um, so Evelyn Forge is an economist and professor in the School of Medicine at the University of Manitoba. Uh, Dr. Forger's research has focused on data on the data associated with the basic income field experiment conducted in Manitoba in the 1970s, the Mincom experiment. Uh, she has been consulted by governments in Ontario, British Columbia, Quebec, Finland, the Netherlands, and Scotland on this topic. 
Her research has been featured on CBC Ideas, PBS Marketplace, and in the documentary, The Free Lunch Society. An updated edition of her book, uh, Basic Income for Canadians, is due out on October 12th. So welcome, Evelyn. Thank you very much, Paul. I'm delighted to be here today, joining you from Treaty 1 territory in Winnipeg. And what I'd like to talk about today is uh, the question that always comes to people's minds almost as soon as we raise the topic of basic income. And that is, can we afford it? Do we have the resources to offer Canadians a basic income? I wanna begin by suggesting that there are really two ways to look at a basic income. We can focus on the upfront costs that governments bear, the upfront costs of getting money into people's hands every month, and we can add all of that together and we can wonder how it is we're gonna pay for that. Or we can think about basic income, not so much as an expenditure, but rather as an investment, an investment in our friends and relatives and neighbors. And if we think about basic income as an investment, then the question we should be asking ourselves is what kind of a return do we get on that investment? We know that there are a lot of benefits to basic income. Monica just uh, very eloquently spoke about some of the benefits in terms of quality of life, in terms of autonomy. Um, we know that there are benefits in terms of social justice and fairness, but there are many of these benefits also have dollar signs attached to them. We are already paying the costs of poverty in this country and we're paying a very high price for it. We're paying for poverty through our healthcare system when we wait for people to fall ill after many years of poor diets and poor housing and hard work and show up in our emergency departments and show up in our hospitals. We're paying it through the criminal justice system when we criminalize poor people. And we pay those costs in all kinds of ways. Um, when, when I started to look at the MINCOM project, about 10 years ago, I went back to find the data on this project that was run in Manitoba in the 1970s. And I reanalyzed that data. And one of the things that I found was that hospitalization fell by eight and a half percent. And just to put that in context, Canada spends over $70 billion a year on hospitals. If we can save 8.5% across this country in terms of hospital days, that's a tremendous saving. And one of my colleagues, David Kalnitsky, looked at crime, and he discovered that during the MINCOM project in the community that received basic income, crime fell by 15%, both violent crime and property crime. And if we think about the costs that are associated with the justice system, with crime, not only the costs in terms of people's lives, in terms of their well-being, but the actual dollar and cents costs that we're paying through all of our other social programs, we realize that the way we're dealing with poverty in this country is actually a very inefficient and very expensive way of doing that. Basic income asks us whether we can invest money up front. And if we invest the money up front, get money into people's hands so that they can live reasonable lives with dignity, there will be savings down, down line. But we also have to look at the other half of this equation. If we introduce a basic income, there really are upfront costs. Somehow, we've got to find the tax revenue in order to pay for it. Can we afford it? Is this feasible in Canada? Well, the cost of a basic income, the cost of delivering it, depends on how you design the program. A couple of years ago, the parliamentary budget officer was asked, what would happen if we took the Ontario pilot that Monica spoke about and we offered it to Canadians across the country? Now, this was a guaranteed income. It was not a universal basic income. Not everybody received the money. If you had income from no other source, you received the full benefit. And the full benefit for an individual was really quite modest. It was about $17,000 a year, but that's about twice, in some cases more than twice, what people received from provincial welfare. A two adult family would receive about $26,000. If there were children, they'd receive the child benefit on top of that. So the parliamentary budget officer was asked, well, what would it cost to offer this program to all Canadians? And he came up with an estimate of $43 billion a year except that we're already paying $20 billion a year in order to deliver provincial welfare in this country. 
So the net cost of that program in ordinary times was $23 billion a year. And just to put that in context, that's less than half of what we pay for seniors' pensions. It's exactly what we pay every year to deliver the Canada Job Benefit. And these are costs we've decided we can't afford to pay. Now this year, they decided to rerun the costs of that experiment. And they discovered, not surprisingly, that during these very unusual pandemic times, the costs of the basic income are substantially higher than they are in normal times. But that's precisely how a basic income is meant to work. It's meant to expand during bad economic times, when people are unemployed, when incomes fall, the cost of the program increases so that we can ensure that people have the resources they need to continue their lives. When the economy recovers, the cost of the program decline. So we did learn that we can afford a basic income in this country, but where would the money come from? When we think about where we're gonna find tax revenue. I think everybody has their very favorite taxes and uh, very favorite ways to raise taxes. Um, one of the places we might look is something that the Parliamentary Budget Officer pointed to. He noted that we're paying more than $122 billion a year to deliver um, tax deductions, in the income tax system, and tax credits that primarily benefit high income people. I'm talking about things like the preferential treatment of investment income. Um, I'm talking about things like the deductions for entertainment expenses for business. These sorts of things cost us a lot of money. We're not used to thinking about them as costs, but in fact, they are costs. And by rethinking the way we deliver taxes in this, in this country and the way we deliver income, we can certainly end up with a much fairer and much more just society. So bottom line, we can afford a basic income. The question though, is do we want a basic income? Thank you. Oh, thank you, Evelyn. Um, I was looking at, at stats can figures and seeing that uh, like when you add up all the different programs that, for income supplements and uh, EI, welfare programs, what the, the provinces dole out, child support, OAS, GIS, it's $177 billion a year already yep. that we're spending. And, um, you know, you, you mentioned some of these, the cost savings in, in health care, uh, the, the cost of poverty, the cost of emergency services for people that are living on the street is astronomical. Um, so the, one of the questions I have for you is, is about... Um, in an unregulated capitalist society, what is to stop landlords, grocery stores, service providers from simply raising the cost of their products by the amount that people are given through a basic income program? You know, OAS and CPP don't keep up with the cost of living. And can a basic income program work without price controls or without a cap on the cost of essentials? Um, and you know, how, do, how, how do we regulate that kind of cost of living? Um, well, first of all, all prices aren't going to increase. We're not increasing the amount of money in circulation. We're redistributing money. So we're taking it away from some people and giving it to others. High income people will have less money, low income people will have more money. And so the amount of money in circulation is still the same. We're not gonna face inflation. But when you ask that question, what people worry about usually is the price of housing. And usually they're thinking about Vancouver and Toronto. They're thinking about cities where the price of, where housing, housing expenses are exorbitant. And the question is, do we need something like rent controls? Well, I'm actually, uh, I actually do think that there's room for many other policies, including rent controls. But I will tell you about a program we have in Manitoba called Rent Assist. And Rent Assist in Manitoba is like a very small basic income. And that has not led in Winnipeg to an increase in the price in, the, in rents. So rents have not gone up, unlike under provincial welfare. In pro, under provincial welfare, when um, the when the rental allowance, when the shelter allowance increases, the costs of low income housing increase almost dollar for dollar. But that didn't happen with rent assist. Um, the people who participated in rent assist, some of them used the money for better housing, some of them used it for other sorts of things. So it doesn't necessarily happen, but yes, there's still room for particular programs in particular places to control prices. 
an, another question. Um, so, some people are willing to accept the CERB or the idea of a, of a, a basic income during this pandem pandemic. What is the argument for having such a program when in normal times, when we're not in a crisis? I think um, a basic income is a form of automatic stabilizer in the economy, right? It automatically expands during hard economic times. One of the things that we saw when the pandemic hit and when we closed down so many firms and when people lost their jobs is that the social programs we had in place were simply unable to cope. And if we relied on what we had in place, it would have caused great hardship for Canadians. And as a consequence, a lot of civil servants burned a lot of hours in a very short period of time to put together these programs in order to, to, to allow people to survive. If we had a basic income in place, it would have automatically come into play. It would have automatically ensured that people had the money they needed. And then when people go back to work, when the economy recovers, when those jobs come back, it will automatically decline. So it's a program that's there as a safety net. And it's valuable not only when you're receiving money from it, it's valuable even to people who aren't receiving money because it's, it's, it's an insurance policy. And they know that if something happens in their own life or in, if something happens on the broader scale, like the pandemic, somebody's going to be there to ensure that they have the resources they need. Yeah. Well, we've got a lot of questions coming through on the chat, but what I'm going to do is move along uh, to our next guest, uh, the Honorable uh, Kim Pate, uh, Senator Kim Pate, is an independent senator who has advanced the national conversation around basic income. Senator Pate is a nationally renowned advocate who has spent nearly 40 years working in and around the legal and penal systems of Canada with and on behalf of the most marginalized, victimized, criminalized, and institutionalized, particularly imprisoned youth, men, and women. So welcome, Senator Pate. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and I apologize, I, I was in the participant uh, section not in where I was supposed to be and my apologies the it's getting dark here uh, in the uh, unceded unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabek otherwise known as Ottawa thank you so very much for inviting me it's an honor to be part of uh, this town hall and I want to uh, talk a little bit about why this is something th this was actually the whole idea of looking at ensuring substantive equality exists in Canada and breathing life into our Charter of Rights and Freedoms was a big part of why when I was approached uh, by folks who wanted to put my name forward for the Senate, I agreed. Um, because part of our responsibility is to represent the long term and the interests of those who often don't end up with a voice. I think it's fantastic that you and other MPs like Leah Gazan and uh, many others are supporting this kind of initiative. But historically, there hasn't been a huge uh, amount of support in large part because, um, as Dr. Forget has just said, while we see benefits and sometimes see benefits very quickly, the long term savings are often not uh, are not seen within a couple of years, but will be seen likely in the long-term savings to healthcare, to, um, to the, in the criminal legal system and other places. And uh, before the pandemic hit in February of uh, this year, I launched an inquiry into the Senate into guaranteed livable income. Not a universal basic income, which is like a demigrant to everybody, but a universally accessible basic income like our health care system. Uh, and part of the reason I launched it in February is I wanted, I was hoping the Senate would do some work on this um, with a view to uh, next year issuing a plan that might be picked up by a government uh, to implement because next year is the 50th anniversary of the Kroll Report. And the Kroll Report was a Senate report that looked at poverty and uh, it was a special committee on poverty uh, chaired by Senator David Kroll. And one of the things they recommended was a guaranteed annual income as the first firm step to fight the war against poverty and to address the issue of poverty, not just the symptoms such as food banks and all of the other ways that uh, laudable, important efforts that Canadians have taken on. Uh, and as someone who had wor has worked for about 40 years with people who are marginalized, victimized, criminalized and institutionalized, particularly those who end up in prison, it's painfully obvious the impact of uh, colonization, racism, class bias, and the fact that we have created infinitely criminalizable groups by creating 
totally inadequate, as we heard from Monica, social assistance schemes in this country. There is not one, uh, one province or territory where people receive adequate resources to live in a way that is healthy, in a way that meets their basic basic needs. And so we need to address that. Um, and so fast forward the next month, we the pandemic hits and suddenly the government pivots and shows that we actually can, as Dr. Forger said, roll out something very quickly that meets the needs of many people and then patches it when there are, it's obvious some people aren't still having aren't still having their needs met uh, and but still leaves out people and so many of us are recommending in fact 50 of us uh, in the senate wrote to the government and suggested that this would be an opportunity uh, for the recovery phase, but also as we continue dealing with the, the COVID pandemic, as we deal with the pandemic of racism, of, uh, of the health pandemic, as well as the social, economic, and uh, racism pandemics, that we actually have an opportunity to do something very different. And so uh, many of us are supporting this, and I want to uh, thank you for hosting this. I also want to thank you for being the first uh, co-sponsor with Leah Gazan of Motion 46, uh, which also proposes a, a guaranteed livable or basic income. So I look forward to the discussion. Um, I think as Dr. Evelyn Forget has said, we already have examples of basic incomes in Canada. We have the experience as Monica, Monica talked about and others will of the, the pilot project in Manitoba as well as in Ontario. And it's long past time for pilots and, pro and projects that are temporary in nature, we need to take this on at a national level uh, for the good of all Canadians. Because we know that if we invest in those who are right now don't, uh, are uh, economically discriminated against, that we will all benefit. Because as Evelyn said, the money will be in, still in circulation. We'll, we'll actually see investment as we have seen with the CERB. Uh, people are spending the money on the things they need to survive during this time. And the same will be true if we uh, take a more permanent measure going forward. So thank you very much. For, uh, it's uh, an honor to uh, be part of this process and I look forward to the ongoing work. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Senator Pate. It's, it's um, been a real honor to work with you on this and, and to have all of this work that the Senate has done. Uh, I'm, I'm really um, pleased with the with the way that you've been pushing this forward with other senators, it's really important. And um, so, yeah, happy to have you have you on board on this town hall. And now um, I'll go I, turn my light on. <laughs> okay, I have a couple of questions for you. Okay. Um, why do you think, from your perspective, uh, that senior policy leaders, government representatives, shy away from serious discussion about a basic income? Well, I think many people are stuck on some of the old. Um, rhetoric around this. I, I just heard as recently as two days ago that senior bureaucrats were, uh, or at least one senior bureaucrat had asked someone who then asked me, uh, isn't this constitutionally undoable? That the, it would interfere with the, the um, authority of provinces and territories. That's absolute nonsense. Uh, the federal government has uh, spending authority. Uh, we've seen during this pandemic that provinces and territories have been very quick to collaborate and cooperate on uh, some national guidelines. And so I think uh, that now is exactly the time to undertake this. Others will say, oh, it'll create communities of layabouts. Uh, other, Again, Monica and Dr. Forget have already put paid to that and other presenters will as well, that in fact, quite the opposite is true. There's no evidence that people stay home more, except people who are trying to improve their education to get a better job or to be able to make ends meet or people who are um, ill themselves or, or it's unsafe for them to be in working conditions as we've seen during this pandemic or people who are caring for other people, the, exactly the, the things we want and need, taking care of children, taking care of uh, family members with disabilities or those who are elderly. And so, uh, in fact, I think it's a lot of arguments that actually don't stand up. Some say those of us advocating are advocating to get rid, to, to put in a restrictive, um, you know, less than adequate income uh, 
uh, in exchange for all the so social supports and programs. That's nonsense. So again, as everybody, all of us are saying, we support childcare, we support pharma care, dental care. I personally also support free post-secondary education. We know that the countries that have the greatest access to social services, economic supports, education, and health system, uh, adequate um, and robust health systems have the not only the highest standard of living, but they're the happiest countries. I personally, I think that's the kind of Canada we want. Yeah, exactly. You mentioned the the caring economy, like home care and people taking care of uh, of uh, loved ones, relatives. Um, that saves so much money in our healthcare system, and you know, you know, in long term care facilities and all that. It's uh, the more that we can allow people to age in place or to to just be with family. Uh, when they're when they're young or with dis disabilities or sick, uh, the the more we're saving in the in our in our systems, our healthcare systems. Okay. So, what is your sense around the shifting of uh, the political conversation around basic income since the COVID nineteen pandemic uh, disrupted this business as usual? Well, you know, just to give an example, my when I first uh, came to the Senate, I talked to a number of people about this being an issue I wanted to work on. And many people said, oh, you know, people will think that's a way out their idea. This is four years ago. Uh, and, you know, in February, I decided, well, I, I have been talking about and doing some of the criminal legal reform issues that I certainly have worked on as well, uh, had done some work on immigration reform as well. But I thought, this is the time to introduce it. Uh, again, uh, I actually think what this has exposed to many, many people um, is the fact that how close so many in the country are to being at risk, both health-wise, obviously, but also income-wise. Many people didn't think of themselves at as at risk. I also think the benefit of, you know, separate and apart from uh, guaranteed livable income or basic income, uh, we've seen the importance of paying people livable wages and the importance of, of benefits like sick leave and, and supports when people are required to work, but suddenly it's not safe for them to work. Or, or as my neighbor was uh, asking me the other day, if, I, if my child goes to school, as is happening right now across the country, and COVID there's an outbreak and I have to keep my child home. I only have two weeks of six benefits. What do I do? And, you know, that's a very good question that I'm sure lots of Canadians are asking. This kind of mechanism, um, this kind of income support would help alleviate that. So I think there's a growing concern and awareness and understanding of the need for this. Prior to this, people who were poor were blamed and many times still are uh, blamed for their own situation. And, you know, as, as Hugh Siegel said in his in his book class that came out a couple of years ago, um, you know, people, if you want people to pull themselves up by the bootstraps, you need to provide them with boots. And, you know, that metaphor, I think, stands that, uh, you know, people aren't wanting to be poor and, uh, and not being able to work. And whether it's Indigenous, you know, in some of the Indigenous and Northern communities I visit where elders have said, we'd love to be taking our young people out on the land, teaching them culture, hunting, uh, creating opportunities, but they can't. There's no jobs, there's no uh, opportunities for them. And we can't even do that because they're, respons they're supposed to be staying put in community looking for non-existent jobs. So we're, we're actually defeating in the, the exact um, initiatives and opportunities that we want to see created. And I think um, that's part of why I, I hope the political will is there. I certainly think the will of the country and people within the country is there already. Yeah. I have to say just um, your presentation to the all, all party caucus, the uh, anti-poverty anti all party caucus the other day, uh, you and a, a couple of other senators, you know, normally the, the, um, that caucus would maybe have eight or 10 participants kind of maximum. I think there was about 50 MPs on that. So it just co goes to show that there's, that we are um, seeing a lot of uptick and in interest on this politically. And I think, you know, it's demonstrating that this is the time. Um, we do have a whole bunch of questions coming up in, in, um, 
the chat, but I'm going to move along to our, our next expert and we'll get to the, some of those questions afterwards. So next up is uh, Tracy Smith Carrier. She's an associate professor in the School of Social Work at King's University College at Western University. Uh, Dr. Smith Carrier's research and policy analysis examines if and how marginalized groups access programs and services in the post-welfare state. Her current research projects involve examining trends in intergenerational social assistance receipt, research on charitable and justice models of social support, human rights, and the design and delivery of basic income. She is a chair of Basic Income London, Ontario. Uh, welcome, Dr. Carrier. Thank you very much for having me. And um, if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen, so you'll have to bear with me for a quick moment. All right. I'd like to start with a question. Um, what is one of the defining ideas at the core of our social welfare system? Um, so I guess make note that social welfare includes income security programs like pension programs and social services. Um, the notion of deservingness. So, um, this notion, um, I think it's really important to situate this idea in its historical context. Um, and having imported a lot of our ideas about social welfare from the British, uh, we really started to see the origins of this idea in the British poor laws of the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, and those laws essentially divided society into two camps. Um, those that were considered the deserving poor the, this would include the sick, elderly, disabled, or widowed, and they were able to receive assistance in their homes without stigma, um, and the undeserving. These were deemed able-bodied people who were given food and shelter in exchange for work in grueling workhouses or poorhouses, um, often stripped up all their resources as well as their dignity. Um, and assistance was actually purposefully designed to be punitive and to be shameful in order to compel people to avoid it at all costs. So when I'm thinking back to the, the notion of people being stripped of all their resources and their dignity, um, I do sort of think at the back of my mind of the, those social assistance programs that um, demand that, expect that, that people will um, um, liquidate all of their assets in order to be eligible for receipt. Except for these beliefs were actually based on some rather faulty assumptions. First was that people are fundamentally lazy and need incentives to work, and B, that poverty is fundamentally an individual problem. Um, and we see markers of this, the latter one, in terms of notions to personal responsibility, people having to lift themselves out of poverty, the bootstraps idea that Senator Pate just mentioned, um, or also markers that sort of lay, lay blame on individuals for being in poverty. So even our employment insurance program uh, under the regular benefits uh, section talks about uh, providing benefits to individuals, individuals who lose their jobs through no fault of their own. The assumption there being that people can be at fault um, for, for being in poor circumstances. But the problem is the vast majority of people um, in poverty today are working. They are generally working in multiple jobs. Um, it's not a question of a lack of motivation. It really is a, a lack of good quality jobs that people are experiencing. Um, and it's those systemic barriers that often uh, prevent people from finding work or working. Um, poor economic conditions, the lack of appropriate accommodations or discrimination in the workplace, uh, the lack of employment opportunities, um, limited access to childcare, a global pandemic, um, that these are the systemic barriers that actually prevent people from, from getting gainful work. And we know too that racial, gender, and class stereotypes linger in society, and that also influences who gets lumped into the undeserving category. And with that comes much scrutiny and shame. So uh, the provision of a basic income could do away with that deserving, undeserving divide, offering income security to everyone without conditions or stigma attached. 
On May the 13th, um, there was a roundtable that I participated in. It was uh, organized by Coalition Canada, the Ontario Basic Income Network, as well as Basic Income Canada Network, uh, asking leaders of women's organizations across the country to participate. It was part of a series of events um, called Making the Case for Basic Income that uh, involved various sectors in society. So there was one on, on labor, there was one for the arts and food security and LGBTQ populations is coming up. Um, the roundtable resulted in about 4,000 signatures endorsing a statement that was sent to the Prime Minister on Tuesday evening, um, urging the government to, to shift away from emergency benefits and to a uh, permanent basic income. So um, thinking about women in spe specifically, um, oops, there goes my PowerPoint. Um, relative to men, women are more likely to experience poverty. They're more likely to shoulder the burden of, of caring labor and provisioning work. They're more likely to be precariously employed in minimum wage jobs, more likely to lose their jobs in pandemics. They're more likely to be paid less for the same work um, as their male colleagues, receive less in pension programs, be abused or trafficked. And we know too that multiple intersections of identity occupied by women compound disadvantage and lead to increasingly more harmful health, social um, outcomes. So what could a basic uh, income mean for women? I think it really means it could pr provide um, greater self-determination and more choice in the many domains of their lives. In terms of employment, offered as an adequate non-conditional individual, individual benefit, so not a household uh, benefit, but one that goes directly to the individual, basic income could enable women's economic independence. Women would have choice either to further their education or training, to start a business, to stay at home, to raise a family, to leave a toxic job for a better one. The basic income would provide more flexibility in determining one's hours of work with the resources necessary to support private or, or public childcare providers. I've also read that um, there's quite a bit of literature talking about the fact that basic income could actually give women more bargaining power in employment to bargain for better pay and for better working conditions. And unpaid work would receive recognition, not as a payment for care work, but universal support for care work, providing everyone with a more, more effective opportunity to engage in it. In terms of housing, a basic income would ensure mothers access to adequate housing options and it would equip, equip women with the financial wherewithal to improve their, their housing prospects. It would provide more housing options to meet families' uh, bedroom and space requirements, increase choice in their neighborhood selection and accommodation closer to important amenities. In terms of intimate partner violence, we know that access to income is one of the most significant factors determining whether a, a woman stays or leaves an abusive relationship. So basic income would provide women the choice if and when they were fleeing um, intimate partner violence, as well as choosing, again, that house in a neighborhood that ensures the family's access to safety. In terms of health and well-being, again, income is the single most important determinant of, of health. The lack of it results in a multitude of adverse health consequences. We know that there's a strong connection between maternal and child health, health, health outcomes. So having a basic income would improve the health and well-being of the mother and child, including the food security of the family. The mental health of women would also improve as they experience the assurance of income stability. So in terms of that letter that went out to the Prime Minister, um, I've just taken a few quotes from, from the, the statement. COVID-19 has intensified many harmful systemic issues affecting women. Rates of domestic violence have risen across the country. Unpa unpaid care work has skyrocketed. Now is the time for Canada to move to a method of in income security that is both guaranteed and accessible to all who need it. Although the CERB has been helpful, we know that it had too many gaps and is ending far too soon. And the employment insurance system that we have, well, in December 2019, 68% of the women that were trying to access employment through that system couldn't. So again, EI is too restrictive and it leaves too many people out. 
Moving away from the notion of deservingness, a basic income would provide enough money so that everyone has their, their needs met, they can participate meaningfully in society and live with confidence and dignity, regardless of employment, disability, race, indigenous identity, gender identity, or parental or marital status. And my references. All right. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, the, it's really interesting, this discussion, you know, the, this determination of the deserving and the undeserving uh, poor. And, you know, I have an experience uh, when I was when I was younger, uh, having a young family and a child to take care of and uh, being in crisis and having to go to welfare. And the process was very demeaning to me. It was not a welcoming process. I felt like my life was being picked apart and uh, and it just really made me determined to never have to have to go back. Um, and I I just like to ask you about the bias that's inherent in these kind of systems that we have already. Like so social social assistance, social welfare. You're dealing with a social worker who may see you in a certain light. Can you talk about this inherent bias and how uh, a basic income would would eliminate that the racism or uh, other discriminatory practices. Absolutely. I mean, that is the beauty of the basic income is that you don't need to report to a caseworker who might have biases and hold a lot of those myths of poverty that we know are so damaging. Mm -hmm. um, a basic income would be, you know, offered directly through the tax system. We would not know um, who is receiving and who is not. And so um, we could bypass that and all of the money already that Dr. Forge already mentioned that, that we pay to, um, you know, to caseworkers to do that sort of monitoring work, well, it would be better to get those caseworkers involved in other things like in housing and childcare, um, where we could, you know, maybe shuffle some of that administrative work um, elsewhere. Um, could be really helpful. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 the case for women, um, when you look at uh, women getting into things like entrepreneurship, um, how would a, how would basic income or guaranteed livable income help help women take those opportunities and chances? Absolutely. I, I mean, my partner is in the in, in the process of, of um, working at several different jobs, um, being self-employed, and we talk regularly about the fact that it would be wonderful if he uh, had a buffer. Um, particularly, he was hard hit over the the COVID situation. Um, but knowing a woman knowing that she has an income that will come in if she's in the process of starting her own business, um, I think just takes away, you know, the fear <laughs> um, that, you know, that they won't be able to survive. I mean, um, I think that's probably one of the, the most um, detrimental um, outcomes for, for our society really is that we don't have people that are taking on um, entrepreneurial activities and projects because of this fear of, of not having enough income. So having that I think would, would really sort of stimulate a lot of creativity and a lot of entrepreneurship. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, to this idea that, uh, that people are inherently lazy and uh, undeserving and when really like people are motivated and I've worked with a lot of, um, uh, disadvantaged uh, youth, uh, youth with barriers to employment, uh, people with diverse abilities and, and programs to get them working. And they are so energized to try to better their lives and earn more money. And one of the things uh, I know about uh, disability uh, here in BC, it's kind of legislated poverty. You are allowed to earn this much more than um, uh, your disability check and then they start to claw it back. And so it's really hard for, there's these ceilings that are there. And I know with, uh, with these kind of programs, it's incremental uh, clawbacks, but there's so many people I think that would benefit in terms of wanting to improve their education, taking on entrepreneurial risk, um, um, just a wide variety of things, people bettering their lives, right? Absolutely. And um, I'm part of a team now that are looking at, um, well, we've interviewed a number of people in the, the basic income pilot in Ontario. And um, I mean, we haven't re released our results or anything yet, but it's interesting reading the findings so far and seeing how many people have, you know, are planning on going back to school and, you know, starting those businesses. And, um, and a lot of that just had to stop when they canceled. So it's yeah. a real team. 
so many people just struggling to get through school these days. So it's Absolutely. incredible. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy. There, there's, we're like over 60, 60 questions in the comments section now. So I'm going to move along and we'll get back to some of these uh, later. And we're going to move to our third expert, who is Robert Case. And uh, Robert is the Associate Professor of Social Development Studies at Renison University College in Waterloo and the Chair of the Wellington Water Watchers, a Guelph-based water advocacy organization. Dr. Case's research and teaching uh, interests include social welfare policy, community organizing, uh, uh, community organization, community resilience, localism, community-based activism, social development, and the environment social ecology. So Rob, uh, welcome uh, Dr. Case. Thanks Paul. Well, that's a lot of uh, specializations I seem to have. <laughs> I need to narrow that down. Um, hi everybody uh, and a special hi to my green friends in Guelph uh, and the KW area. Um, just to maybe introduce another layer to this uh, basic income uh, discussion, just kind of introduce a little bit. Uh, I'm part of a, a group of academics who've been trying to get ourselves organized to really dig in a little bit around the environmental implications of uh, basic income or rationale, environmental rationale for uh, basic income, particularly looking at the potential of a basic income in making a transition to a sustainable economic paradigm. Um, you know, and with all this renewed uh, discussion of basic income right now and really in the mainstream has exploded, uh, it seems like an opportune time uh, to add to that momentum a uh, push from the point of view of the growing numbers of us who are concerned about climate change as well. Um, and there, there does seem to be kind of a, an implicit connection between basic income and the environment. Um, for example, if the Green Party of Canada, uh, like Green parties in lots of uh, other parts of the Western world, has been a consistent champion of basic income. Um, I think the basic income shows up in the documents around a, a, a Green New Deal. Um, yesterday, I think it was Greenpeace for another example, uh, just released an alternative throne speech for our prime minister, along with policy recommendations that include a basic income. So it's, it's out there, <clears throat> but there doesn't seem to be any explicit explanation of what the implications are for the environment or any, uh, anything about the relationship about that. There's very little in the academic media or academic literature, not much in popular media, despite the spike in uh, content on basic income. And even among environmental organizations that are in favor of it, the rationale tends to be about the income inequality and poverty reduction without much attention to the environment. And I think part of that's got to do with the fact that we don't have a lot of empirical data to draw from. or haven't had like broad-based applications of this idea uh, for long enough that we can generate that kind of data. But despite that, um, I think um, that we can, I guess, anticipate that you know, as the climate as climate change advances, more and more Canadians will experience disruptions in their incomes, like we have with COVID. Uh, but in the case of climate change, the things like uh, think about things like fires, uh, floods, things like that that affect people's livelihoods, or uh, even the spread of new emergent diseases or the spread of diseases to new parts of the world that used to not be affected, um, or even uh, disruptions caused by in the traditional industries caused by uh, resource exhaustion and other forms of ecological collapse. Um, so that's kind of a defensive rationale for basic, in basic income as a, as a safety net in the context of climate change. Uh, an automatic stabilizer, I think Dr. Forge said, an insurance policy um, against that, those types of disruptions that we can expect more and more. COVID is not the only one, uh, I think you would agree. But proactively too, if you know, we're gonna make the shift from a fossil fuel-based economy to something more sustainable, and especially if we're gonna do it rapidly enough to actually um, have any hope of mitigating a uh, full-on climate catastrophe, um, that transition is going to cause some disruptions. Uh, there are jobs in it. I know the Green Party's, uh, will will talk about the new jobs, they'll be creating new sectors, but nonetheless, there will be job interruptions and job losses uh, in that transition too. So in that sense, maybe the basic income uh, it makes sense as an investment in that sort of safety net to support that transition, um, to not dump it onto uh, workers in an undes undeserving way. Um, and to take this step further, I'm not sure if everyone will be with me on this, but if our goal is ultimately to replace our current economic paradigm, which is based on continuous economic growth and the accumulation and concentration of wealth, if we want to replace that with a 
low growth or even zero growth steady state type of economy, uh, we're going to need to find ways to generate and sustain collective well-being by taking much less from the earth overall and distributing it way more efficiently uh, than our current economic system is able to do. In that type of economy, a full employment would neither be achievable nor desirable, as my colleague Jim Mulvale points out. Uh, and the deserving, non-deserving distinction within the social assistance system would no longer be relevant, really. So we need some other mechanism for making sure wealth gets distributed rather than concentrated. And, and a basic income would seem like a viable part of that equation as well. But in, during, in the interim, to me, uh, one of the more powerful potentials of basic income is in, is in the way that it helps to decommodify de labor, as they say. Uh, there's an author, Simon Birnbaum, who put it like, said, you know, it severs our dependence on ecologically harmful engines of growth. Um, in other words, you know, supported by basic income, just for a, a really relevant, current, currently relevant example here in southwestern Ontario and elsewhere, I think, small-scale independent farms supported by basic income would actually remain a viable option against the existential economic pressures and competition uh, to sell out to the developer or the factory farms that do so much ecological and social damage. It would make that uh, type of lifestyle viable and that's that form of food production and distribution viable um, for longer. Uh, a basic income increases the viability of staying at home uh, in your own community, even with marginal employment options and contributing to your local economy and your local community rather than taking off and moving to say Fort McMurray in search of a livelihood in the old uh, dirty economy. Uh, it, gives it gives working people more choice, more freedom to engage in creative ventures, to participate in community uh, life and politics uh, like Monaco described so uh, eloquently uh, and even get directly more involved in things like climate action. So there, there are challenges uh, that we need to overcome in trying to articulate a pitch for basic income from an environmental point of view. Uh, people ask things like what happens when you give more people more money, don't they spend more and consumption goes up? Um, isn't it going to cost a lot? Meaning that we have to uh, sort of fuel up the, the nasty old economy and uh, make it counterproductive. These are questions that they really need to become at, overcome at a rhetorical level. I think answers to these are already here embedded in some of the economics uh, that Dr. Forge was talking about, about where the costs really lie and where consumption really happens. But even if there are some remaining conceptual challenges, it does, it seems to me uh, that now is the time to add, uh, while the tension's on a basic income, to add this element to the discourse around it uh, because the climate change, unlike uh, COVID-19, hopefully, climate change is, uh, is not going away. Uh, and there is this, uh, there's a momentum around it. Basic income alone, of course, uh, is not going to get us uh, all the way to a sustainable economy on its own. We'll still need strong public services and public policies of various kinds to go along with it. But uh, I just want to leave you with a thought uh, that you can help me develop, hopefully, uh, that, you know, it's a pillar, one pillar in a forward-looking, ec ecologically oriented social policy framework basic income might just be the kind of investment we need for the reasons already outlined uh, and maybe an investment also in the future of our planet. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you very much. Um, I was uh, listening to or heard about the CCPA, uh, Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives report that the billionaire class in Canada have increased their wealth by $38 billion during the pandemic alone. Um, so, I'd just like to ask you, what are your thoughts on a wealth tax? And, the, you know, there's no inheritance tax for these people to pass on all of this wealth to their, their family members. And uh, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that and the general inequality that we have? Yeah, yeah, no, I think uh, I'm in favor of a wealth tax. And uh, uh, just for your information, the thing I read from, the, from Greenpeace this morning also calls for a wealth tax to help to fund a, a basic income. Uh, I do think that that inequality... In more equal, economically equal societies, there is more recycling, stronger environmental policy, and all those sorts of things. So inequality is correlated, at least, uh, with those sorts of things. And ultimately, I think, um, if we think even further ahead to that steady state economy I, I mentioned, this is something, again, that my colleague Jim Mulvale points out, is that um, for, I guess, working class Canadians, if you look at uh, 
household incomes trends over the years, they're basically already living in a steady state economy. Uh, economic growth drives uh, accumulation at the top in the 1%. That's what drives this inequality. So as a model of economic development and progress, what we have now doesn't seem to really be working socially, uh, let alone ecologically. I think it is in that, uh, that drive to accumulation that creates a greater gap. I think that's really where the problems of consumption are, not at the level of people spending, uh, people like Monica, uh, or you and me, most of us, spending at the daily household level in our local economies. Um, so I, I think that's uh, basic income has that, the potential of bringing the social and ecological and, and uh, economic kind of together uh, in that sense. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, when you, you have a program like CERB the, where people were getting money basically to get by, they're spending that in their local communities. Nobody's going off uh, on vacation or, or buying luxury items. Yeah. with that kind of money. And they're not going to be doing that with a, with a guaranteed livable income or universal basic income either. Yeah. Um, and it, it goes into that circular economy of your, of your community. I really yeah. liked what you, you know, you said about, about farming um, and uh, we, you know, cause we need more localization of our food system. If we're yeah. looking at the structure of our, of globalization at this point, you know, we just saw with the pandemic, the, the problem with, uh, personal protective equipment all being produced somewhere else. Yeah. We don't produce it here in Canada. Right. And w when you look at food, it's the same situation. We we're getting our food from California and Mexico and China and other places, a food that can be produced right here in our local communities. And supporting local farmers, not only does that help um, uh, alleviate climate change and lower our carbon footprint on our food, but it it provides valuable uh, employment. That, uh, yeah. I, know, I know a lot of farmers and young people that are really enjoy doing that kind of work. Yeah, I, um, I, like, I like what um, the discussion a minute ago also about uh, unleashing um, localized uh, entrepreneurship. Like it just it provides a, a safety net uh, so we can tolerate some risk to uh, push against that kind of centralization of uh, everything economic and food production included. Um, and I guess the other, like what, what would you say about uh, shorter work week or reduced hours or shared work or you know, those kind of things with uh, this kind think, of program. I mean, I think that's the way we, we're going anyway. Uh, I think that's uh, what we have to face. The problem, the problem is, though, that uh, in our current paradigm, without redistributive mechanisms like a basic income, um, what it means is you only get paid part-time and you don't get the benefits. All the benefits of that part-time economy go to the shareholders of the, the business. And so again, um, we need some way to, uh, maybe it's a dirty word, I don't know, but to socialize uh, the benefits of a shorter work week. A shorter work week makes sense if we can sustain uh, livable uh, incomes. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's no better than what we have now. And I think a basic income, uh, as Dr. Porsche was talking about, it's redistributing wealth that's really uh, generated from our collective goods and means really um, is a way of taking a bit of that at the very top uh, and redistributing it for more efficient use of said resources, I guess. Um, I'm going to go to the questions that are in, in the, uh, the Q and A section here. And if you, if you haven't noticed yet uh, in the audience, there is a little thumb symbol on the bottom left of each question. And so those questions are getting voted up uh, to the top. And so I'm going to ask the top one now. Um, I'll, I'll ask you, Robert, how do you adjust uh, this for the difference of cost of living in rural and urban areas? And how do you keep people motivated to work if, if they're able to work? Um, I'm not sure I can answer that at a technical level of how do you adjust the cost, but uh, the motivation to work thing, I think is an interesting one that goes back to, uh, you know, uh, the question of, I think it's, a, it's an assumption um, uh, about, you know, I think most people want to be productive. I think that something that keeps them, people unproductive now in our current system, especially low income people, is the way that the uh, welfare trap kind of works, keeps people locked in poverty. Uh, and I think what we need actually is to release people to do, but listen to Monica's story. We need to release people to be able to do what they uh, um, build on their talents, take risks, um, produce and uh, participate in those sorts of things. So um, I can't answer how you adjust the amounts. I think there had to be a formula. Uh, maybe someone else on the panel can speak to that. 
Um, sure. But uh, I'm personally, after looking at the research I've seen, I'm not that concerned about the motivation to work thing so much. Does anybody else want to hop in on that uh, question about adjusting? I think like there's there's things like the um, well, go ahead. I'll let you get to handle that one. Oh, you're you're muted still. Sorry, I missed that. Um, I think we need to remember that basic income is only one policy as part of a whole range of things that we're offering. And so, if you think about something like the price of food in the north, for example. I think it would be unreasonable to expect to adjust a basic income in order to deal with local problems. If we see it as a floor, if we see a basic income as a floor, that leaves a lot of space for other policies and other jurisdictions to step in to deal with particular issues. So if you think of the price of rental housing, for example, in Vancouver, um, that you know, it's perfectly reasonable to think about the BC government or even the city of Vancouver doing things to address the cost of housing in Vancouver, in addition to a basic income. If you think about the price of food in the North, you can think about the federal government putting in a place in, in, in place a, a program that deals with the delivery and the cost of food in the North and offer that in addition to a basic income. But I think we need to think about a basic income in the same way that we think about the child benefit or in the same way that we think about um, OAS, where we don't necessarily adjust it for every community across the country. It's just one part of the whole range of services that we provide. Uh, yes, yeah, so we don't lose those other those other programs, as I was mentioning before, affordable housing, uh, uh, right. affordable public transit, making sure that we have affordable food. Um, if you think about if you think about the strengths of particular levels of government, I mean, the closer a government is to people, provincial and municipal governments, they're in a position to know precisely what services are needed and precisely what the problems are in that local community. The federal government, by contrast, is very good at efficiently raising money and dist redistributing it. So, uh, uh, another question? Oh, you have something to add? Huh? Yeah, I, well, one of the things uh, that in addition to what uh, Dr. Forger said is, I think we can actually uh, look at if if some of this is done through the tax rules in the way that uh, GIS is and that we could actually do variations based on uh, what you know, what parts of the country you are in the same way that we do with taxes now. So I think there are some other ways and um, of doing that that don't replace services. And I saw some of the questions, wouldn't this get rid of childcare? No, quite the opposite. Many of us still believe we need subsidized childcare, uh, but it would provide resources that allow, you know, some people have said, all we really need is programs, not funding. Well, when you're poor, what you need is money. And so uh, you can make many other things more affordable, but really fun to, and you need to put in guidelines for things like rent controls for sure but I think it is completely doable yes so we have a question from Ivan uh, let me see yes has has anyone uh, done a detailed cost benefit analysis of guaranteed income compared with our current system does anybody want to hop in on that no Prevalent. Okay. Dr. Forge. No. Um, no, nobody's no, done a cost. It's, it's, okay. it's, virtu it's virtually impossible to do that kind of a cost benefit with this kind of a program. I think that people have looked at particular areas and particular consequences. So they might look at healthcare, they might look at particular areas, but it's virtually impossible to, to do a detailed cost benefit analysis of the type that you might do for a much smaller, um, more detailed program. And do you know, have, have, have any other countries uh, have this program in place and for how long and how is it funded? Uh, there have been a number of experiments, of course, in countries all over the world, high income, middle income, low income countries, and they've mostly run for short periods of time. In low income countries, um, these experiments are usually funded by external agencies, USAID, for example, or uh, the World Bank. Um, in high-income countries, in Finland, um, in the Netherlands, um, there were government-funded experiments that were run similar to the Ontario project, but they've been for short periods of time. There's never been, um, there's never been a permanent basic income, to my knowledge, that uh, runs anywhere in the world. Okay. 
Here's another one. Uh, Brown asks, how would uh, GLI interface with the odious Indian Act? Could it bring improvements to First Nations? And I know this was one of the this was one of the calls in the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls uh, Inquiry. So I'm just wondering if anybody wants to add to that. Um, it's it's a recommendation. Um, I know uh, one of you mentioned earlier about um, uh, Indigenous people being able to I'll go ahead, Senator Payne. Uh, well, in fact, if you want to listen, our podcast appointed, we talked to Murray Sinclair, uh, Dr. Negan Sinclair, and also um, Nathan Obed about this very issue. And in fact, they talk about it as actually increasing the likelihood of so sovereignty and self-governance, uh, providing these kind of resources. So uh, there is certainly could be some interface and also the fact that the majority of Indigenous people live in urban centers, so they would likely be impacted by the changes to social assistance, uh, all the more so than the, uh, the issues around the Indian Act. But yes, the, those are some of the discussions we've been having. Okay. Um, let's see. So this is a question that the UBI idea is ultimately based on the idea that providing money to solve the problem of housing, healthcare, transportation, childcare will provide a, a real solution. However, what can be done to ensure that a landlord won't increase rent when workers get UBI? What do you say to people who think we what we need in government is uh, providing housing, guaranteed affordable childcare, free public transit, free dental care, et cetera, instead of UBI taking money away from enacting those services instead. Uh, many on the left think we need a transition from the capitalist mode to the socialist one. The Green New Deal and the Leap Manifest mostly address these needs from a collectivist perspective. So I know we've part of this has been answered or asked and answered earlier on, but does anybody want to just step in and talk about, about this? I'll take a little shot at it. I mean, <clears throat> I kind of, uh, I like the question a lot because I think um, for me, one of the uh, reservations I have about uh, a basic income actually is just that, the privatization of social care uh, uh, rather than the collective approach. And, and I do think that, uh, I mean, I think it has some benefits over traditional social assistance, the means tested social, social assistance, um, but I, I'm personally not in favor of a form of basic income that replaces all of those uh, more collective social supports. I think it needs to be a, a pillar in one among uh, many social supports. Uh, I, you know, Milton Friedman, uh, the great champion of uh, neoliberal capitalism, likes uh, basic income. Also, that's enough to like a negative income tax style. That's enough to make anyone kind of nervous. Uh, libertarian thinkers have also. Uh, treated as an opportunity for government to limit its role to issuing a check and backing up. I think that's something that we do have to uh, pay attention to. So all that to say uh, is a good question. I'm glad someone brought it up. Yeah, I think we, we, we need to work towards balance and there's a lot of things to balance out. And this is just, this is one piece of the puzzle to, uh, to, to deal with poverty. Um, next question, David asked, to me, one of the attractions of a basic income system is that people do not have to apply for it, pass a humiliating means test and be scrutinized to see whether they are violating the rules. So I favor a universal basic income rather than a guarantee that tops up only certain people. Can you talk about the relative merits of these two uh, systems? Maybe Dr. Smith Carrier, you want to take this one. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> I was just going to say, I think one is far superior. I mean, I don't think anybody wants to go through humiliating uh, interviews. And um, I mean, we, we have lots of stories. Uh, Monica has already shared her story. Um, lots of stories of, of um, some really great caseworkers as well as uh, ones that are, you know, really stick to the rules. And, um, and so, yeah, going through a system that, again, nobody will know. There's no stigma. There's, there's sort of none of the, the, the rules and the, the problems associated with social assistance uh, within the basic income. So it's uh, much simpler and, um, again, promotes dignity. Yeah, absolutely. Can I add a, like a, okay. a devil's advocate thing here? Um, I generally, I got to say, I agree. Um, but I have been convinced, actually, by one of my uh, students who did some uh, research on this that, you know, one thing that can happen 
uh, in our social assistance system. It doesn't happen enough, but can happen is uh, for people who need it, there is a support mechanism that can kick in where a financial worker, because uh, you have a relationship with them, can be, and I've seen it actually with uh, some people I've tried to support here in Guelph, financial worker can actually be a really strong support in terms of plugging in all those other social supports around a person. Uh, and we do, so there is a risk for at least some people, we lose that function by making it now uh, a relationship between the person and CRA, uh, where they don't get those types of supports. I'm not saying that the best way to do that is to drag people through uh, all the means tested uh, bureaucratic bullshit. Uh, I'm just suggesting that that's something that we might want to take into consideration. Okay. So we've got a few people that want to weigh on this. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't disagree with you, but the reality is exactly what uh, Dr. Forget said and, and uh, others have, um, uh, uh, Ms. Smith Carrier, I'm sorry, probably Dr. Smith Carrier, um, said that the reality is we're talking about freeing up time for people not to just be going through the masses of paperwork around whether they deserve to have uh, the the supports, but in fact, providing that very vital support by assisting people in the community. So that's what we're talking about, not eliminating those positions, but in fact, allowing them to do the work they did. When I talk to social workers and I go and speak to classes of social workers and I ask them how many of them know that most of their job is going to be policing people's incomes, they're shocked. But that's, that's what most social workers are doing. They're not doing the work that they thought they were going to be doing. Yeah. Dr. Bourget. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that there's a difference between providing voluntary supports that people can access if they want to access them and mandating visits to caseworkers in order to access supports that people may not need or want. I think it's really important to give people the autonomy, but to also put uh, to also ensure that services are in place for those people who do want them. I mean, one of the one of the really interesting experiments that ran recently were a set of experiments in the Netherlands and one of the cities, Utrecht, um, actually looked at different ways of organizing and providing services. And um, they found that if you freed up people from the bureaucracy of the previous system and actually put caseworkers in place that people could contact if they wanted to, who could provide client-led and client-supportive services, then those people were not only much happier and healthier, they were also more likely to find jobs and to become independent of the system. So it actually worked very well for them. The differences between mandating um, a certain relationship between the people who currently provide services and making sure that the services are available to people who actually want to be helped. Yeah. Um, another question here, Sally, can we reduce or take away subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. This would pay for a guaranteed income program. Um, we, as government, government makes choice about uh, choices about uh, what industries they subsidize and how they use uh, tax dollars. Those are tax dollars uh, providing subsidies. And so, absolutely. I mean, you can you can move subsidies from uh, different ind industries, remove them from one in industry, and incentivize another industry, or use those subsidies. Uh, or programs like this. Um, another question, will a program be tied to a cost of living index? Does anybody wanna touch on that? Should be. Should be, should yeah. Be, it should be tied to, um, it should be tied <laughs> to nominal GDP. That way we can ensure that the poor get their fair share of any economic growth going forward. Right. Um, that, I think that that's one of the real limitations of the current system where um, payments are put in place and they're not adjusted year after year and inflation changes in the cost of living simply eat away at the real value of those so that people are living in far less real dollars now than they were a decade ago. So tied to something like the low income measure yeah. or um, the... That would, that would be fine so long as it's tied to some some form of yeah. uh, economic well-being. Um, I just got a comment from Michael. Uh, he would urge everyone on this call to read The Deficit Myth by Stephanie Kelton. Uh, Canada can afford a GLI. Taxes are not required to fund a GLI. Or as mon modern monetary theory proponents prefer a job guarantee program. Also, a, G a GLI is a universal income program. There will be no army of civil servants determined 
determining eligibility as it is universal. If you make more money, it is taxed back. Uh, it's also been argued that a GLI would require significantly less uh, civil servants looking over your shoulder. Um, uh, there's another one here, just it's a longer question. It's got a, a, some examples, but we have a black market. And uh, uh, will, will a universal basic income add to tax evasion? And I would say that the biggest tax evaders and tax avoiders are the 1% and they're offshoring their money and there are millions of loopholes for them to go through to, to not pay their taxes. And uh, we need to capture that money. I'm less worried about somebody doing a construction job under the table than I am about a billionaire that's not paying their fair sh share of taxes here or uh, co corporations like Google or Apple or YouTube, uh, uh, Facebook, who sell advertising in this country and don't pay any taxes on it at all. So those are the, those are the tax scoff laws that I would be going after in this country for sure. It, will there be a black market um, based on some people on lower income brackets uh, than the, the billionaire class uh, uh, using a UBI? I'm sure that, that there likely will. I don't know if anybody wants to add to that, but that's my rant. <laughs> um, so next question is, uh, Jacob, what strategies do you plan to use uh, on using to get more Canadians on board as well as MPs? That's a great uh, question, Jacob. That's part of what we're doing here. Um, Elan, uh, I've, got, I've got a petition on guaranteed livable income. This is the second one that I've done and it's live on my website. Um, I have to remember what the petition number on it is that you could search out. Um, but we are, the, the purpose of doing this um, uh, town hall is to motivate people to contact your member of parliament. So the, the petition number is E2836 and it is open for signatures right now. Um, there's uh, Coalition Canada Basic Income. There's the, the website for them and Coalition uh, Canada Basic Income is going to be doing a day on the hill. It's actually a week on the hill, October 20th to 22nd. And so we would urge you to uh, get in touch with your member of parliament tell them that you're interested in seeing these kind of programs implemented uh, in Canada. And um, that will help with this lobbying effort that uh, Coalition Canada is going to be doing that week. And so we're seeing more interest uh, in this. Um, there is a, a letter that's available on the uh, Green Party website. I, it's greenparty.ca slash English slash GLI town hall. And um, you can send a letter to the prime minister uh, uh, supporting the idea of a uh, guaranteed livable income. Uh, so there's, these are all actions that, that you can take to help uh, push things forward. And the more that we talk about this, the more that we educate people about this, the more likely we are to see it uh, implemented. And I, I'd like to thank uh, the guests that I've had had on today, uh, the expert panel, uh, the honorable, honorable uh, Senator Kim Pate, um, for all of your work on on this effort. And um, thank you, Monica, for for sharing your story. It's really important to hear firsthand how this has worked for people. People are uh, need these kind of programs to improve their lives, and and in general. The majority of people want to improve their lives. They, we are not a lazy species. We are industrious, active, engaged uh, citizens. And, uh, and this is a program that will help us to continue to be that way. Um, guaranteed livable income, universal basic income. These are programs that actually uh, encourage people to volunteer and do things that don't uh, generate income for them, but are very crucial to our communities. The volunteer sector, uh, you know, drives a lot of the social sector in this country. So I know uh, we're at time. Any any last words? I'd just like to thank all of all of the guests, uh, uh, Dr. Forger, uh, doc, Dr. Case, Dr. Smith Carrier, uh, Senator Pate, and um, Monica. Thank you all for your time. Please visit the base uh, the Coalition Canada Basic Income website. And uh, get active on this issue. Let your member of parliament know how you feel. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>